This presentation is about data assimilation for thermoacoustic instability. Uh, thermoacoustic instability is a huge problem in rocket engines, and you can see two blown up rocket engines here after thermoacoustic instability. And these days it's also a problem in gas turbine engines, both land-based uh, and those on aircraft. There are many elements to this presentation. Uh, the majority of the experiments were done by Francesco Garita. Um, the Kármán filter I present will, um, was done by Hans Yu and Luca Magri. Um, and uh, Ushnish Semgupta has been doing some pure data-driven machine learning on this. There's actually nothing on that in the presentation, uh, but I may end up talking about it um, as we go on. So the story starts um, with this annual review paper that I wrote with Sujit in 2018. Um, it was actually, the invitation to write it was in 2014, and between 2014 and about 2016 when we uh, wrote it, um, I must have read about 200 articles on thermoacoustics going way back to the 1950s. Um, and a common theme that runs through them is that uh, thermoacoustic instability has been a problem since the 1930s. Um, and the curious thing is that we understand the physics well. Um, the physics is relatively simple. It's to, it is that um, if you compress a gas when it's cold, it doesn't take much work. Uh, and then if you add heat and increase the pressure when the gas is hot and then expand the gas, you get more work out of the expansion phase than you put into the compression phase uh, and thereby turn heat into work. And now if you replace the piston of the car engine uh, with a simple acoustic wave, which is doing the compressing and decompressing, um, you find that if you get extra heat release uh, at moments of higher temperature and pressure, and a bit less heat release at moments of lower temperature and pressure, uh, then you turn some of that heat release rate into work and thereby increase the amplitude of the acoustic wave. So that's the mechanism, we understand it well. Um, and yet uh, engineers have never, never been able to reliably eliminate thermoacoustic instability before full engine tests. Um, to take an extreme example, the F1 engine of the Apollo program um, on, the, on the Saturn V, uh, they required uh, about 2,000 full-scale engine tests at enormous cost in order to eliminate thermoacoustic instability. Um, and this is because thermoacoustic systems are so sensitive to small design changes that any models of these um, systems contain severe sy systematic error. Uh, so if you're trying to design out um, thermoacoustic instability on the drawing board, um, the problem is that your, the model you have of the thermoacoustic instability is not sufficiently accurate, that your design is, um, has not got any thermoacoustic instability. Um, so the idea of this project is to say, uh, instead of trying to make a, a quantitatively accurate model a priori, can we um, start from a qualitative model of the physics, which we have uh, quite a lot of confidence in, and then use lots of data from experiments to make that qualitatively accurate model quantitatively accurate? Uh, and the idea is to make it so over the range of which we test, but if it's a good physics-based model, um, then it should be able to extrapolate beyond the regions in which we've tested. Now, we didn't do this on a rocket engine or an aeroplane engine. We did this on a very simple thermoacoustic system. It's called a Rika tube. It's just a vertical tube. Um, and in our case, we have an automated iris at one end, which allows us to change the um, acoustic reflection coefficient at that end. Uh, and then we have an electric heater inside the tube as well. Now, we can vary the power of the electric heater and we do so from zero up to around 380 watts. Uh, and that sets up a convection current inside the tube. And the acoustics occurs on top of that, what we call the base flow. Um, and the first part of this uh, project was to quantify what that base flow was. Um, so we do that with a simple one-dimensional conjugate heat transfer model. So we have a flow uh, in the middle. The flow goes, um, what we have here in the box on the left is a slice of uh, the Riga tube. The flow uh, moves up from bottom to top. Um, it's a buoyancy driven flow. Uh, we imagine that we have plug flow inside, uh, so just a uniform um, velocity profile at a certain temperature Tg, which is a function of x, which is the downstream distance. Uh, and over some distance delta x, uh, there's some heat transfer from the gas uh, to the solid walls, and then on the outside from the solid walls to the external gas, which is at temperature Ta. So this is simple second year undergraduate stuff. Um, heat comes in at the flame or the heater at this point. Downstream of that, you have a high temperature. Um, and then as heat gets lost to the walls and thereafter to the atmosphere, um, the temperature drops. Um, and uh, upstream, of course, we have a, a uniform temperature at the ambient temperature of the air. So the temperature of the gas uh, is a zero, well, ambient temperature. It jumps when it passes the heater, and then we get a, an exponential decay 
um, very, very nearly uh, through the rest of the tube. Um, and we have the temperature of the wall as well, which is what we can measure very easily with the thermocouples. And now we have a model with a number of parameters, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, and a number of measurements, which are the thermocouples. Right, the parameters are the um, inviscid or viscous loss coefficient of the heater. In fact, we found that above a heater power of around 50 watts, uh, the loss mechanism seemed all to be inviscid, so we dropped KV. We just did with KI, the inviscid um, uh, pressure loss coefficient across the wire. In other words, pressure drop is half rho u squared, where that's the velocity of the air going through the tube, um, times KI. Obviously, we have G, which we know well. Uh, HI is the heat transfer coefficient from the gas to the wall of the um, Riga tube, and H outer is uh, the heat transfer coefficient from the wall of the tube to the gas outside. So those are the parameters. Uh, and now for the measurements, um, we have a set of thermocouples on the outside. We have a thermocouple at the bottom on the uh, inside. This is the air going through the tube, and one measuring the temperature at the exit. Um, what I'm showing here is the very first setup we had. Um, it's no surprise from what I'll show later, but I'll say it now, that uh, you find that the air temperature is really what we need for the, um, so the gas temperature inside the tube is really what we need um, for the acoustic model. Uh, and actually we found it was, because that's such an important measurement, we found it far better to just squeeze some thermocouples inside the tube and measure that temperature directly. So although not shown here, um, that was one of the key measurements that we did take in the third round of experiments. So having explained the parameters that we'll be assimilating um, and the measurements that we have, I'll now move on to one of those parameters, that's the inviscid loss coefficient uh, here at the heater, um, and uh, show the experiments in which we work out what this inviscid loss coefficient is. Um, on the horizontal axis here we have time in hours, uh, so each experiment lasted 23 hours um, and then with a one hour turnaround time we'd start another one. Um, and uh, during that time, we'd increase the heater power from zero, uh, sorry, from zero to 10 watts, and then 20 watts, 30 watts, etc., until we got to um, 180. Now we define the state of the system uh, as the temperature as a function of x, and we measure this at a certain number of points. Uh, the temperature is both of the gas uh, and of the wall, and on top of that state vector containing the temperature. Um, we put the parameters that we're assimilating, the inviscid loss coefficient, the um, actually the Nusselt number on the inside and the Nusselt number on the outside. Um, and then uh, as time goes on, we use an ensemble Kármán filter to assimilate this data. So this works by running um, 50 ensembles of simulations of the flow with slightly different values of Ki and slightly different values of the state um, and of Hi and Ho. And then uh, every second we um, incorporate the data from the experiments uh, and then that collapses the um, state down and the parameters down to something more accurate. Uh, we then in, inflate those slightly and then move again, move on again for another second uh, and repeat the process. So we're doing this process every second. And as we do so, Ki is um, converging to what it is at that moment in time. Um, it's worth saying that this, this uh, experiment never reaches steady state. Uh, so we end up having to have a sort of dynamic model that's moving um, very, very slowly in time, and then we do these acoustic pings I'll talk about later, last around a second, so the flow is quasi steady uh, during an acoustic ping, um, but it's not steady uh, in time um, in the sense it doesn't reach a steady state. So what you can see here is the invis inviscid loss coefficient. Let's look at the uh, the red and the black line to start with. Um, these, by the way, are at a heater position of 0.45 and 0.55, uh, so that's um, roughly in the middle of the tube. Um, and uh, you can see that Ki, this inviscid loss coefficient, starts off quite high, a little bit lower. Once we get to around 50 watts, um, it settles down to something at around 9. And uh, what we're seeing here is that the flow, um, while well, lamina at very low powers, becomes a sort of lazy turbulent flow. Uh, we get an inviscid loss at uh, this heater here that is modeled by, quite nicely by a single uh, loss coefficient Ki over a large range of heater powers. Uh, and that's a reasonably large range of velocities. We'll, we'll come on to that later. Um, another thing worth noting is that um, when the heater is at 0.4 and 0.5, this actually coincided with the position of the thermocouple. So we threw away the information from that thermocouple. Uh, and this is obviously the thermocouple not just on the outside, but on the inside as well. Uh, and when you do so, you throw away your most valuable bit of information, which is the temperature just across the other side of the, of the heater. Uh, and this really is reflected in the results you see here. For the green and the yellow lines, we've thrown away our most valuable piece of information uh, and the assimilation, the values, well, not bad, 
are definitely not as good as they are for the um, red and the black lines. And I think one of the hazards of this process is that um, the process shines a light on bad experimental design. Um, and uh, every time you run it, you think, oh, I could have designed it a little bit better. And that's why this is our third round. Um, I'm presenting here the third round of experiments. And even then, you know, you can still design it better. So I think experimental design could be an entire talk in itself. So I'll skip over that point and move on to the next chart, which is for the um, Nusselt number on the outside. So that, if you like, is the non-dimensional heat transfer coefficient from the metal tube on the outside to the air outside. Um, and here, much the same story as a function of time, or equivalently, heater power. Um, we see the Asa Nusselt number um, converging to something sensible around 100. Uh, and for the black and the red, that doesn't change a great deal. For the other two, it does vary a bit. Um, in this case, we actually expect the Nusselt number on the outside to scale with the Grashof number to the power of one quarter. So we expect this to increase slightly as the heater power goes up. Uh, and that indeed is what we see for the black and red lines. Um, but, but not greatly. So this is um, taking a missile number on the outside of roughly constant of 100 uh, is reasonable, again, across a, a wide range of heater powers. Uh, and then we do for the same for the missile number on the inside, the heat transfer coefficient, coefficient from the gas uh, to the wall. Um, and here we're seeing, again, for the black and the red lines, reasonably constant, and not totally constant, but a reasonably constant value of the missile number on the inside over a wide, wide, wide range of heater powers. Um, and much more uncertainty uh, in the yellow and the green um, because we don't have that uh, information about the temperature just downstream of the heater. So this is our data assimilation of the base flow. We're really doing it to get this, which is the velocity of the flow going through the tube. Uh, within the model, this is a plug flow um, velocity profile. Uh, that's all the model does. We didn't go any more detail than that. Um, and you can see the velocity going from around 0.2 meters per second up to roughly 0.5 meters per second um, as the power increases. Now, we tried to measure this. The problem is if you put a hot wire, from, um, a hot wire anemometer at the bottom, uh, you get radiation from the heater, and that really disrupts the hot wire signal. Um, we tried that. We tried shadow graphy. We tried all sorts of things. We could guess from looking at the pictures that the, of the shadow graphy that the speed was of this order, um, something under a meter per second, certainly. Uh, but with this model, and particularly with knowledge of the temperature jump um, across the heater and knowledge of the heater power, uh, you can get flow rate um, and therefore the mass flow rate and therefore the velocity through the tube. And this is a number that we use later uh, when we come to the thermoacoustic model. Okay, so having quantified the base flow, and as a reminder, this base flow changes slowly over time. It never reaches steady state. Um, but at the same time, over the ping that I'll describe next, uh, we can consider the flow to be quasi-steady. Uh, and then we do an acoustic experiment on top, which I'll talk about now. Um, for the acoustic experiment, uh, there, are, there are two types. I'll explain one here. We have a speaker at the bottom of the tube, uh, which creates a ping. Um, the, this is listened to by uh, six probe microphones. So this is what a ping looks like. Uh, on the bottom axis here, we have time. This is in seconds, so zero seconds here, one second, two seconds. So the whole bottom axis is 2.5 seconds. And what we see here are the pressure signals from the different microphones. So in green, we have a microphone um, very near the downstream end. Uh, red is one bit further upstream, so about here. Uh, blue, and then um, these two here are very close to the middle. Um, they're not actually shown exactly where the microphones are shown here. And so the ping consists of a forcing for just about one second, um, very near to the natural frequency of the tube. And so you can see the response of the tube here and all the microphones increases to a steady state amplitude. Actually, in this period here, we can get the reflection coefficient of the, um, of the downstream and the upstream end, uh, if we can see the upstream end through the heater. And then thereafter, we switch off the um, loudspeaker and there's exponential decay for the rest of the time in all of the microphones. And again, in that period there, we can get the reflection coefficient of the downstream end, which does actually change a little bit during the decay rather than during the forced signal. Now here on this axis, um, we have here the decay of a, of a ping experiment. Um, in this case, the ping wasn't quite the same. It was far more abrupt. But the main point is the same. Once the ping finishes, you get a very nice period of linear decay. Now, depending on the decay rate, um, this will be two or 300 or even 500 cycles. Uh, so we get this linear decay over a lot of cycles. It means that we can get this decay rate very, very accurately. Um, one rather nice thing about this experiment is that we're often looking at the case that's very close to marginal stability. So uh, 
the decay rate is measured over many hundreds of cycles, uh, and again, we can get that very accurately. Uh, the error increases um, if this period is shorter, in other words, if the decay rate or the growth rate uh, is much greater. And I'll just mention we have another set of experiments where we use active control to keep the system stable, switch off the active feedback control, and then uh, measure the growth rate as well. Now, I think the neatest example of uh, the data assimilation done over the acoustics is actually to look at the case of the tube in, with the heater inside it, but with the heater switched off. So what we have here on the horizontal, there are four figures. Let's look at the top left figure. On the horizontal axis is the position of the heater within the tube, ranging from the bottom end at zero to around halfway um, at 0.55. And uh, on the vertical axis on the top left figure, we have the decay rate of oscillations. The real part of S is the growth rate. Uh, and being negative, that means this is a decay rate. Uh, and then here we have the frequency, which we've moved into hertz rather than radians per second um, because it's just marginally easier to understand. What we see here on the left is the case of a tube containing the heater alone. Now, um, the first thing we did was take the heater out and uh, measure the reflection coefficient at both ends of the tube, assuming they're the same. Um, once we've done that, we put the heater in, uh, and what we find is that um, the decay rate uh, increases when you put the heater in. This is basically due to thermoviscous dissipation of the heater. Um, part of that is the viscous dissipation, uh, very like what we saw before for the flow past the heater. Uh, you basically get a, um, a force in the opposite direction to the local velocity around the heater, um, a drag force. But that's not all. You also have to include an, another more subtle effect, which is that the, um, as an acoustic wave passes something that has thermal inertia, uh, it, it transfers heat to that object that has thermal inertia. There's always a heat transfer across a finite temperature difference. Um, and uh, that causes an entropy increase, um, which therefore think of that as turning mechanical energy into thermal energy, and that acts, acts as a source of damping on the system. Now, in this case, you have to model both of those effects. And what you see here is the results when we say, um, we'll add in a thermoviscous effect uh, and calibrate the parameters of that to um, the experimental data. So the experiments are the uh, solid circles, sorry, the open circles that you see here. And the model, um, once those parameters have been tuned, uh, is in the, the stars. And you can see that it works very, very well. You match the frequency and the decay rate very accurately just with uh, those parameters in the model. And here there, there are four of them. There's the absolute value of the um, visco, viscous dissipation, which we'll call K viscous of the heater. There's a thermal uh, value, which we call K thermal of the heater. But there's also a time delay, um, which you also have to include. And uh, we initially were surprised by that time delay. Uh, but if you go back to Lighthill's 1950 paper on uh, 1954 paper on that, you discover that's in there and indeed has exactly the same sign as the one that we've discovered um, experimentally although the sizes are not quite the same. So we've now on the left calibrated the cold model. Now I mentioned that um, we discovered in our, in, our first, in our third set of experiments that we put thermocouples inside the tube. Um, when you put thermocouples inside the tube, you get the results on the right-hand side. So this has a thermocouple and the heater. You find there's almost no change at all to the frequency, uh, but the decay rate has increased. So this line here has shifted down a bit. And that's simply due to the thermoviscous mechanism at the thermocouples. Um, so we have one more parameter to tune for that. Uh, it's simply the um, k-thermal of the uh, thermocouples, uh, and we link it to have the same um, proportion as that for the heater. So there's just one extra parameter, but we can fit the results um, very nicely again. And this is for the cold flow case. Now, the technical details of fitting for that, this is um, essentially fitting least squares. Uh, it's, it's quite simple. Um, uh, you can also work out the... Um, uncertainty as well, uh, but that's not shown here. And now we turn on the heater and look at the thermoacoustic effect. Um, now this, this is a work in progress. Um, we have uh, a simple model in this case. We say the heat release rate at some time t is n, which is just a number, times the velocity at some time t minus tau, so with a time delay. So this is a simple n tau model. It's the simplest model that contains um, the physics that we're trying to uh, emulate here, that we're trying to model. Um, and it's very commonly used in thermoacoustics, and it's a very sensible place to start. The results I'm going to show right now, we say that n is just some number kn times q bar, which is the heat release rate, uh, and tau, we say, is some uh, number k tau times 0.2 times the d wire 
um, diameter of the wire divided by u bar. This is why we needed to get u bar from the base flow model. And that comes from Light Hill's 1954 paper um, about heat release rate around a wire. And now we um, assimilate the data to work out the most probable values of Kn and K tau uh, and their uncertainty. Now this is a work in progress and actually what I'm presenting here are the results from the very first round of experiments we did. Um, and you can see here Kn on this axis, uh, K tau on this axis. Uh, this is the most probable value uh, at the middle here and you can see here um, plus or minus uh, two, roughly two standard deviations here, one standard deviation here. This is the percentages here. Um, and you can see that this is a, a nice sort of circle um, rather than being a, a long thin line. In other words, K and K tau are sort of nicely decorrelated from each other, nicely independent of each other, which implies they're good choices for parameters in the model to try to assimilate. So on the next slide, I'll, I'll present some published results um, looking at the case uh, of the, the third round of experiments. Um, on the horizontal axis is time, or if you like, heater power. On the vertical axis is uh, decay rate at the top um, and frequency at the bottom. Um, and what we have here in, in red is the model prediction, in black is the experiment, um, for an n tau model. So on the left is just when we say n and tau are constants. And so we find the single value of n and the single value of tau uh, that can match these 100,000 data points. And on the, on the right, um, we stick n as well and then look at k tau. So we're assuming here that k tau, if I just go back a slide, uh, is, is tau is k tau times 0.2 dy upon u bar. So we're using the u bar in the second case and not in the first case. Now, so what we have here are two different models for the heat release rate of the wire. And uh, you can fit the data reasonably well with both models. Uh, that's not a great surprise. Um, and we're fitting the data, I think, reasonably well over a large range of heater powers and uh, heater positions um, with just two parameters. Now that, of course, presumes that you, you can do that, uh, that when you move the heater up and down the tube, uh, this time delay doesn't change, and uh, n, which is the, the fluctuating velocity, causes a fluctuating heat release rate, and that just, you're assuming that that n is the same wherever you place the heater. Now, in fact, our work shows us that isn't quite the case when the heater is very close to the entrance of the wire, for, of the tube, for example. Um, so it really makes you question your model, and I think that the, the question of how to deal with model error and comparing one model with another model is the sort of third layer here. It's the, it's the bit that you dig down to once you've been through all the other forms of data assimilation, uh, and I think it's very tricky. Uh, and that's roughly where we are now. Uh, now, uh, all of this um, is or will be hopefully published in the ASME Turbo Expo 2020, of course, which is meant to be happening around now uh, in London, but of course isn't taking place. Uh, but we have the paper on that, um, which uh, details the experiments um, and one type of data assimilation. Uh, it's a wonderful data set, and uh, we won't just treat it with one type of data assimilation. I think we will do several different types of data assimilation on it. Um, so I didn't mention how many experiments we have, but we there are roughly 100,000 ping experiments, acoustic experiments, and then um, uh, 23 hours uh, of, I think, 10 days of experiments for the base flow. So a vast amount of experimental data. Uh, and we have two models here. One is the base flow model, one is the acoustic model and we're tuning a handful of parameters to this very large data set. Now, we observe that when the model is qualitatively accurate, its parameters can be inferred accurately. It does require the model to be qualitatively accurate. Um, and now I'm going to assert something, which is uh, a question that's come up before. How do you avoid overfitting? Um, and I think we do that because the model is physics-based. I think there's a lot to be said on that, and it really comes down to how do you choose a good model? Now, so what? I'd say this approach is like debugging a code in the sense that you run a code, debug it, debug it, and so on, but you're doing this for a physics-based model. So you're assimilating the data into a physics-based model. If it doesn't work, you go back and tweak the model and see whether the data fits it better. Um, now, I'm aware that to the, to the data scientists, uh, they don't like doing this sort of thing. Uh, I guess I come at this from a physics-based modeling approach, which is where you primarily want to be able to model your experimental data well. You can go on to do other experiments afterwards, or, or indeed save a set of experiments in order to check that model. But fundamentally, we're after we want to model well. Now, experiments can be automated, and these assimilation tools are well developed. I think experimentalists and modelers should do this sort of process routinely. I think the day of, of plotting 10 results on a, on a chart and then drawing a line through them um, really are, are, are coming to an end um, because now you can do so many experiments um, and do proper assimilation instead of just drawing a line of best fit by eye. Um, 
And the reason why we as a group are doing this is because once we've got an accurate model, um, we have all the tools already for adjoint based gradients, then you have a procedure for optimal design. Often we are making these models in order to design something, uh, and by making the model quantitatively accurate, we can now use that model for optimal design within the range over which we've tested it, and if it's a good model, beyond the range in which we've tested it. Now what next? I think there's a lot to be done on refining physics-based models. Um, we can use physical insight from adjoint-based sensitivities. You don't have to, um, but I think it really speeds things up when you do that. Uh, now, if that fails, I think you could use data-driven models for some components of a physics-based model. Uh, and this perhaps is the way to get the best of both worlds. So when you know the physics well, you use a physics-based model. When you don't understand the physics well, you use a data-driven uh, model, but a much smaller one. You don't try to data make a data-driven model of the whole system, uh, you try and make a data-driven model of part of the system. Um, and just as a final point, um, experiments are great because you get so much data. I mean, think of CERN, a vast amount of data, but they're tricky to set up. So, you know, it might take you, if you're CERN, 20 years to set up an experiment and then for one microsecond of results. We're not quite that extreme, but it still takes several months to set up an experiment that then runs for 10 days. But I think having got this good data set, uh, I think it really is good for us to all share them. And the, uh, the special interest group of the UK Fluids Network really gives us the forum to do that.